Welcome to this premiere of Decoding the Conflict Mindset. I'm Dr. Deborah Dupree, the Mindset Doc. You know, one of my goals in doing this podcast is to bring to you thought leaders from various walks of life that shed insight and awareness and tips and tools for how to navigate through a conflict mindset, whether you're actively mediating dispute, representing clients in disputes, or simply trying to navigate life as a leader or as an employee. Decoding the conflict mindset can apply to all walks of life, and that's why I'm here. And I'm so excited to share with you today's guest speaker, George J. Chanos. George and I happen to connect on LinkedIn around our common topic of mindset shift. And one of the things that I quickly learned about George is what an incredible, rich background he brings just to his life experiences. Starting off as a litigator, successfully arguing his case before the Supreme Court and won, and then became Attorney General for the state of Nevada. Well, he didn't stop there. A major life-altering event in 2012 shook up his world and caused him to take a different look at where he was going. Well, that journey led to a long letter to his then 15-year-old daughter who, because he almost lost his life, and that letter ended up turning into a book. Well, he didn't stop there. He went on to write another book because given her age and what he felt she had to, has yet to face in the coming years, he felt it was important to pass on insights and wisdom. So today, George is joining us and he has so much to say, so please devote your time to this one. It truly is worth it. How to surf the technological tsunami and dance with machines. This has led to his book called The Millennial Samurai. And it's not just a book, it's a movement to empower people to make change in their world. So don't go away, share this important episode with your friends and colleagues and make sure that you subscribe so you know when our next guest speaker is coming out as well. But George is going to rivet you. So set aside some time, share it with a friend, and be ready to write down some notes because I certainly did when I was interviewing George. So take it away. Countdown's coming. George Chanos, surfing the technological tsunami and dancing with machines where we're headed in the world to come. Welcome to Decoding the Conflict Mindset. Hi, I'm Dr. Deborah Debris, the Mindset Doc. One of my goals with this particular podcast is to bring to your attention how major life events can redirect our entire world. Because our guest speaker today, George Tano. Yes. Okay, thank you. Glad I got that right. Has had one of those major life altering events in his life. And I can identify with that because about the same time, I had some big stuff going on too and said, you know what, Deborah, it's time to do things a little differently. And so George has been on an interesting journey, and I'm so excited to to have him here. Welcome, George. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, George, you have a really fascinating background, and I, I know that our viewers already heard a little bit about your background and you know, why I've asked you to be here today. But, you know, one, as I saw that you were actually the Attorney General in Nevada from 20, 2005 to 2007, and then we know what happened in life. Tell us a little bit about that experience, and then what was your life-altering event in 2012. Okay, so um, I've uh, spent most of my professional life as a complex problem solver. So I went to law school, ended up working for one of the largest firms in the world, went out on my own, started my own practice, and ultimately uh, serviced clients from all walks of life, including many high, high net worth individuals, corporations, public officials, and essentially they would come in with problems that they couldn't solve by themselves. And so they needed some assistance. And uh, that's essentially what I did for a living, ultimately serving as Nevada's attorney general and ultimately arguing before the United States Supreme Court. Successfully, I ended up winning 9-0. And in 2012, you know, several years later, I had a heart attack. Mm-hmm. And at the time, it was unexpected. I didn't know know that I had any health conditions. Turns out I had high blood pressure and needed high blood pressure medication. So anyway, got that under control. But at the time, my daughter was only 15 years old and it was a serious heart attack. It was 99% blockage. It was uh, two stents and uh, the two stents had not been successful. It would have led to open heart surgery. And so I thought, well, what if this happens again? And my 15 year old daughter uh, loses her father. And so I thought, well, I want to advise her on certain things and I want to make sure she gets that advice before I pass away. And so I began to write her a letter and that letter ultimately became very long. And as it became very long, I realized that 
you know, this is beginning to look like a book. Why don't I make it into a book? And why don't I leave it not only to my daughter, but to other young people, my nephews and nieces, other young people that could profit from it. And so that became my first book. That was Seize Your Destiny, A Roadmap to Success. And, and it actually sent me on a journey into a, a whole new area, which is what brings me to your show today. It made me realize that this was almost a calling, really the highest and best use of my time. So there are many things that I could be doing with my life, but probably none more important than helping other people. And so I've been doing that, you know, on a, on a case by case basis as a lawyer, but now I wanted to do it for a broader audience. I wanted to do it for more people. And so as I start, finished my first book, I realized that the world that I had lived in, the world that I had talked about in that first book was not the world that my daughter was going to live in. She was going to live over the next 30 years. What was that going to be like? And I had never looked at that. And so I put on my researcher hat and I started researching and I started looking at what everyone was writing about the next 30 years, what was going to happen. And what I saw was astounding and really surprised me to the extent that I thought, you know, I'm a pretty well-read guy and educated individual, and I don't know any of these things. How is it that other people know these things? They, they probably don't. And so I decided that I needed to share that information, not only with my daughter, but with others. And so that became the second book called Millennial Samurai, A Mindset for the 21st Century. So why millennial and why samurai? Well, millennials are whatever you happen to think of them. There was the greatest generation, then there was my generation, the baby boomers, and then there were millennials, and then there's Gen Z, and behind them will come alphas. But millennials, as we move into the uh, tectonic changes that are going to occur over the next decade and, and two and three decades, millennials will be at the tip of the spear as humanity enters this new technological tsunami that's on the horizon. And so it will be incumbent upon them to address many of these monumental challenges and embrace these incredible opportunities that are coming forward. So that's why millennial. Samurai, because in order to succeed, they're going to need to be warriors. They're going <laughs> to need to adapt to a constantly, uh, rapidly and radically changing environment and they're going to need to embrace some of the ancient core values that the samurai, the Bushido code, that the mm -hmm. samurai embraced, uh, things like character and courage and commitment and compassion. So Millennial Samurai begins with the ancient core values, then it goes to core principles, then it talks about issues that matter, the issues of the day, global warming, economic inequality, high rates of incarceration, racism, all of these issues that we're talking about today are discussed in the book with a balanced approach towards each of these issues. It basically tries to get at the truth. I don't have an agenda. I'm not pursuing some kind of a political philosophy here. I'm registered nonpartisan. I was Republican, but I was a socially liberal Republican. So I was pro-choice. I was pro-LGBTQ. I you know, believed in some uh, rational measure of gun control. I wasn't uh, what you know people are coming to see Republicans as today in, in certain circles. So I was always a moderate and I have come to the position that there are 340 million people in the United States. They are equally divided. At no time have we been more divided than researchers have had to go back 160 years to the Civil War to find a time where we were this divided. I believe it's an existential threat. I believe that collaboration and cooperation among humanity's varying groups of people is essential. And I believe that you need to lead from the middle. I believe that you're not going to lead this diverse group from one polar extreme or another. You're going to have to find middle ground. There are great ideas that are coming out from the left, and there are great mm -hmm. ideas that are coming out from the right. And there are some really horrible ideas that are coming out from the left and from the right. right. And so we need to cherry pick. We need to pick mm -hmm. the best ideas, and we need to move forward in a united fashion towards solving our problems. So that's, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm writing about. That's what I'm speaking about. And that's why I'm here today. Well, um, you know, you, you touched on so many, many elements that I'm not even going to begin to sort of capsize on all of them, but just a couple of things stand out. But, you know, you just emphasize again how important it is to embrace a, a change in mindset. You know, if we, I always like to say, if all we have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And yeah. so we need to look at things differently and gain perspective and what I call the 360 degree perspective. And people go, oh, I never thought about it that way. Well, communicating to have conversations, not confrontations. 
Yeah. And more from a learning perspective, what can I learn from how you see things? Not that I have to agree with it, but I can at least listen to it and lean on maybe there is some common ground in there. Maybe there's some new ways I can be looking at things differently. And so I appreciate what you said in the very, you know, as you started talking about your book is that no matter what you think of them, and we certainly have had a lot of disparaging remarks, unfortunately, because there's a lot of creativity, innovation, ingenuity. Uh, and yeah, they're, they're entering into a whole brave new world out there that we've never seen before. And the next gen behind that, you know, are true digital natives from the, from the time they were born, you yeah. know, uh, have even a different approach to it. So it's all about learning. I guess, you know, a couple of things, uh, George, is that when you think about this this book, I've seen some of the the uh, testimonials, which are absolutely amazing, and I'll come back to that. But if there were two or three main takeaways that you would want people to know about your book and why it might be a good read for them. Yeah. Well, first of all, I'd like to encourage them. I believe it's a it's an essential read for them, not just a good read for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and they can get a free copy of the book. This isn't about selling books. They can go to millennialsamurai.com. And they can download the entire 444 page book for free, wow. right? Not a sample, not a chapter, but the whole thing. Or they can go to amazon.com where you read the reviews. There are mm-hmm. probably 40 or 50 five star reviews. They're all five star reviews. Mm-hmm. Some people have said it's a secular Bible for the 21st century. Others have said it should be in every home in America. So it's gotten some fantastic reviews. But the takeaways are essentially this there is a technological tsunami on the horizon, mm-hmm. right? And it is going to hit us like a tsunami, much more quickly than any of us are expecting. Let me read you something just from today that, okay. I, that, I, that I just read. So Eric Schmidt, the former CEO and executive chairman of Google, uh, is leading the Special Competitive Studies Project, right? And that group has released a 186-page report that makes it clear that our geopolitical, technological, and ideological futures are all highly correlated and about to change very mm-hmm. radically. The report states that by the end of this decade, okay, we're talking about in the next eight years, yes. quote, by the end of this decade, we will know if we will live in a world shaped by free expression, tolerance, and self-determination, or dictated by censorship and coercion. Okay. Again, we're talking about world defining events that are less than eight years away. Now, how did, how did we get here? So. They go on to say that China's political, economic, demographic, military, and technological calendars align in dangerous ways in the second half of this decade. The groups, they basically are saying that that China and the United States are locked in a battle for technological supremacy. We're both moving at artificial intelligence with warp speed. Mm -hmm. Now, Stephen Hawking, before he died in 2014, theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking said that artificial intelligence, the singularity, that moment in time when machine intelligence will eclipse human intelligence, will be the greatest event in human history, greater than fire, greater than the wheel, greater than anything that man or woman has ever conceived of. Ray Kurzweil, the head of artificial intelligence for Google, says that that moment in time, that singularity, will come as early as 2029. Uh, Elon Musk has said sooner. I believe it will come sooner, but it will come before the end of the decade. And Vladimir Putin in 2017 said that he who controls artificial intelligence will control the world, will be able to subjugate all other world powers. And so, you know, imagine a race where two superpowers are moving at breakneck speed to secure an advantage in AI or quantum supremacy and that only one of them will win that race. And whoever wins that race will be able to dominate, will be able to control all others. Mm -hmm. So Kurzweil goes on to say that although the singularity will come by 2029, by the 2040s, which is only 20 years away, by the 2040s, artificial intelligence will not be our equal. It will be a billion times, a billion times more capable than human intelligence. So we go from the singularity to a mind-boggling acceleration of intelligence, right? Everything that mankind, you know, that humanity has, has, has discovered, all of our knowledge since the dawn of time will double over the next 10 years. And then it will increase exponentially, not over 10-year periods, but over one-year periods, yeah. right? Just or over monthly periods, right? So the, the pace at which society will evolve Mm -hmm. is accelerating 
you know, you look at evolution and evolution has historically been a very long laborious process, right? That has taken millennia, right? Has taken thousands of years, millions of years, right? And now we're talking about doublings that are occurring in, in very short order, right? And so that is a very radically and rapidly changing environment, right? So what do you need to do to survive and thrive in a radically and rapidly changing environment, right? right? So survival of the species. Yeah. Uh, what was the, give me the name of the author. I, Dar- Darwin? Darwin, yeah. It's Darwin said that it's not the strongest or the most intelligent that survive. It's those most capable of adaptation. Adaptation. Right? Mm-hmm. And so that's really the takeaways are, are number one, that life over the next decade and beyond that, will require continuous adaptation and lifelong learning, right? Automation will replace most jobs, right? So today, McKinsey and Company says that 47.5% of all jobs that exist today are susceptible to automation based on existing technology, right? That number will move to 90 or 95%. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, 90% plus of the American public was engaged in farming. Mm -hmm. And then after the Industrial Revolution, only 10% or less were engaged in farming, right? So we had this massive shift at the Industrial Revolution. Well, now we are entering a technological revolution that will dwarf the Industrial Revolution, right? In terms of the speed at which it moves, and the magnitude of the change that we will experience. So how do we as human beings maintain our relevance? How do we compete with machines? How do we dance? I refer to it as surfing a technological tsunami and dancing with machines, right? How do we dance with machines, Mm -hmm. right? What do we do that is going to allow us to not only survive and thrive, but to be happy, right? Mm -hmm. And to live meaningful lives. So these are the things that Millennial Samurai talks about and provides advice and guidance on. And part of it, you know, one of, one of the things is this understanding and awareness of, mm-hmm. of what's going to happen. That's something that you're going to need. You're going to need to understand that adaptation is going to become a requirement, an absolute requirement. It already is, but it's going to become even more profound. Lifelong learning, you're not going to be able to sit back and not study and not read and not educate yourself and, and not inform yourself. You're going to have to engage in lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. Knowledge is going to become more accessible, right? So today you go on your phone, you you look something up on Google and it gives you an answer fairly instantaneously. In 30 years, you'll just think of a question and the answer, your neural cortex will be connected to the cloud and the answer will just come to you automatically. But you're going, so you're not going to need knowledge. You're going to need intelligence. You can't get an answer from Google if you Mm -hmm. don't know what question to ask, Ask, right? So you need to know what question to ask right? And that comes from intelligence, right? So you're going to need to learn to think critically. You're going to learn to be more intelligent and be able to ask the right questions and be able to source information. In a sea of information, this mass overload of information, you've got to search for the relevant information, what I call disconfirming information, right? Information that tells you that you're wrong about something. And the reason you're looking for that information is because if you're not wrong, if you're right in your beliefs, then you're fine. You don't need me or the book or anything else. You're doing great. But if your beliefs are wrong, and they may be, in fact, quite a bit of them probably are, then you need that disconfirming information. Yeah. You need information that tells you you're on the wrong path. You have the wrong idea. You have the wrong thoughts. So another thing I would tell you is that, you know, imagine this is like you're jumping out of an airplane. You're jumping out of an airplane and you're plummeting to the ground like a rock because that's the speed at which things are going to move. Now, the good news is that you have a parachute, but your parachute doesn't work if it isn't open. So your mind needs to be open. It needs to, you know, you can't, you can't put information into a closed mind, right? You know, you can't teach, you can't learn with a closed mind. So you need this open mind. You know, you talked about a perspective, you know, all these different perspectives and how they're important. I was fortunate enough when I was 12 to read Ogilvy on Advertising, David Ogilvy's book, a classic in in the area, and in which he talked about a helicopter perspective. Mm -hmm. And he basically said that some people have the ability to rise above 
a situation and look at it from a 360 degree perspective. They gather all the information that they can from mm -hmm. all these varied perspectives. Mm -hmm. And once they have that helicopter perspective, then they engage in critical thinking and they analyze all of that information from all those different inputs. And ultimately that's what I've used to solve problems for my pro entire professional life. And it's what I'm using today. You have to be able to connect the dots, connect the, mm -hmm. the data points from a very divergent collection of information. This is what polymaths do. Polymaths mm -hmm. are not deep learners, they're broad learners, right? So they learn a great variety of information and then they're able to draw from that huge body of information, from that broad perspective, they're able to draw on these different data points and piece them together into a composite of, of what's really going on in the world. And so that's what I'm trying to do with some of the bigger issues of the day today. Wow, you have taken on some major topics. And I mean, again, you you just tapped into so many different things. I've been taking notes because I'd like to bring some of this out in the show notes you know, as, as viewers and listeners um, pay attention to this because, you know, you have really embraced a very comprehensive and yet high level view. Like you said, the helicopter view, William Urey in uh, my street resolution field has, has a saying, go to the balcony, you know, because when yeah. you go to the balcony in a theater, you get to see everything of what's going on. And even then you're going to miss some things. But I, I'm curious because my show is them to reach out to lots of people, but primarily the leaders of today, the lawyer advocates, the mediators who are in a position of helping people navigate through com conflictual times and not just in interpersonal conflict, but maybe organizational conflict or community conflict. I mean, again, you've raised so many issues, particularly around the technological advances and, and where this is going. It's almost mind boggling. But I'm curious if you could, you know, translating what you've shared with us already about your book to our leaders and whatever profession they might be, how might they use some of this information and your insight to help them navigate their organizations to hopefully continued prosperous times that meet the needs of the people and yeah. meet the needs of the organization? So you mentioned William Urey. I believe he co-authored Getting to Yes with Roger Fisher. Absolutely. Yeah. And I actually negotiated against Roger Fisher back in 1995. Oh, wow. Yeah. Quite a long time ago. And wasn't that before the book? Uh, well, well before my book. Yeah, well, I, well, before his book, I think Getting to Yes was in 88, if I'm correct. Yeah. So 95 is after that. Okay. So the book was out. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, this was this was part of the Harvard negotiation project. Mm -hmm. um, I went back to Cambridge and participated in the Harvard negotiation project in ninety five and ninety six. Okay. And as part of that project, Roger Fisher called me up on stage to negotiate with him in front of the group, and we did you know essentially a mock negotiation, mm -hmm. which was fascinating. I learned a great deal both in ninety five and ninety six from that program about negotiation and dispute re resolution. Mm -hmm. But some of the things that I think lawyers and, you know, obviously I am a lawyer and, and have been for quite some time, some of the things that they can take away, let's, you and I briefly talked about the human brain mm -hmm. and you've studied this and you know about the human brain and uh, you know, as well as I do, that we've learned more about the human brain in the last five years than mm -hmm. the last 5,000 years. Yes. <laughs> and, and so the discoveries are coming more rapidly as we're able to put people under imaging technology and watch the brain operate as it's experiencing, you know, solving math problems, for example, and, you know, or, or feeling sensations from, you know, stimuli, how is the brain reacting? And so we're gathering tremendous amounts of information, so much information that we can actually uh, study brain waves and convert them into text. So you might be thinking about something and not articulating it, but they've been, they're undergoing experiments where they're studying brain waves and they're able to decipher these brain waves with enough information. Soon they'll be able to read our thoughts. Yeah. Um, so, and control our thoughts or mm -hmm. input thoughts. So, there's some things that I've learned. Again, I'm a broad learner, I'm not a deep learner. So, there are people who know more about mm -hmm. all of these subjects that I'm talking about. But maybe not a lot of people that know more about as many different subjects yeah. as, as, as I know mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. So when I think of the human brain, I, some things that have uh, kind of made change the way I think of the world and the way I think about conflict resolution, the way I think about communication and, and uh, advocacy. First of all, our brains receive 11 million bits of information per second, every mm -hmm. second of the day. This has been going on since the day we were born. And our conscious brain can only process 15 to 50 bits of information per second, which means that the vast majority of information going into our brain is entering our brain outside of our conscious awareness. We're not even aware of it, but it's in there. 
And it's affecting how the brain sees the world and, and how it functions and how it recognizes patterns and, and how it behaves. And so it's important to recognize that your brain is a double-edged sword, that sponge-like quality that allows it to take in all this information subconsciously, allows it to learn, right? So there'll be a point where you'll go to sleep and you'll wake up the next day and you'll know a new language, right? So this malleability and sponge-like nature will be harnessed and will mm-hmm. be leveraged to uh, create massive increases in learning. But it can also be used to manipulate us, right? Mm-hmm. Because we're not aware of some of the things that we're receiving. So through broadcast media, mm-hmm. through mainstream media, through uh, social media. I mean, we haven't begun to understand the significance of social media, mm-hmm. but it is the first wave of the technological revolution, right? And it's already causing uh, significant disruption. Suicides right. have tripled among some age groups. So this technology is having a profound effect on our brains and, and on, on our behavior. So first of all, understanding your brain, understand that you are uh, influenced by confirmation bias. You are influenced by motivated reasoning. Your brain is is involved in pattern recognition. So if it sees the same information over and over and over and over again, it may begin to conclude that that information is true, even Mm -hmm. though that information may not be true. It just may be very repetitively fed to you. Right. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I've seen studies where researchers have been able to put a person in a room for two weeks and convince them that they've committed a murder, yeah. you know, that they haven't committed, that they're mm-hmm. completely innocent enough. But when with enough information being fed to them, the brain will actually become confused about where it heard that information. Is it a memory? Is it something that the detective said to them, or is it something that they're remembering from actually having happened? right? And so when, when you look at the brain and you understand some of these types of issues, you understand, first of all, that, that our thoughts are like transitory packets of information mm-hmm. that are derived from our senses that may or may not be true, right? Mm-hmm. So just because you have a thought doesn't mean it's truth, right? So first understand that, understand that about your client, understand that about, you know, opposing counsel, opposing parties. They have these thoughts, but they're not necessarily real. They're not necessarily true. They're real to them, but they're not necessarily truths. Understand that we all have a, our brains are, you know, similar in hardware, Mm -hmm. but very different in software. So the life that you've lived is very different than the life that I've lived. You've read different books. You've read different articles. You've gone to different schools. You've watched different movies, listened to different music, had different friends, had different experiences. It's no wonder that you would see the world differently than I see the world, right? Now, when you understand that, you understand more about why people, I used to, I used to be baffled. I, I would know these people mm-hmm. and let's say someone thought that Bill Clinton was the greatest president in the world. I mean, I know today, I know today people that are two billionaires, for example, super bright, Harvard, Yale educated, immensely successful. One of them thinks that Donald Trump is the greatest president we've ever had. The other one thinks that he should never be allowed to serve in office again, right? Two brilliant people with very, very different perspectives. How is that possible? Yeah. And, the, and the answer is it's possible. You know, and who's right, right? Mm-hmm. Who's right? And the answer is that, you know, our brains, we see the world not as it is, but as we are, yeah. right? That's from the Talmud. That's ancient wisdom, right? Mm-hmm. So when you add up all this information about how the brain works, that makes eminent sense, right? So what does that tell you? It tells you, number one, if people understand all of this, they will become less wedded to their beliefs, Mm -hmm. which is important. If people understand all of this, they will begin to see alternative perspectives, not as threats, but as assets, right? right? We can actually benefit from someone's alternative perspective, Mm -hmm. right? So it will give them cause to have an open mind, right? If they understand all of this. So we need to create awareness. We need to get information out. That person who has an opposing view is not your enemy. They are your asset. They are an asset. Embrace them, learn from them to give you that helicopter perspective that you so desperately need to survive and thrive in the 21st century, right? So that's that's part of what I would tell people. I would also, you know, I believe as uh, Milton Friedman's concept of people operate out of self-interest is a very important concept, yes. right? So if you want somebody to do something for you, or if you want somebody to understand something, let them know why it is in their self-interest 
to understand this. Just like I've explained why it's in your self-interest to look at an alternative perspective as an asset, as opposed to a liability, you know, you're going to do that now because you recognize that as being in your self-interest. You're not listening to that other person because it's polite or it's, or, you know, it's good etiquette or it's good for them. Mm -hmm. You're doing it because it's good for you, mm -hmm. right? So let's, let's harness that motivating force, right? Self-interest. And when we talk about things like homelessness, or we talk about things like economic inequality, or we talk about things like environmental pollution or gun control or whatever the issue might be, or, you know, LGBTQ marriage rights or mm -hmm. the right to control your body or whatever the issue happens to be, mm -hmm. we have to explain to people why it is in their self-interest to believe the way that we believe they should believe, mm -hmm. right? Why, why is it good for them, right? right. So this is a great techniques for solving complex problems are a helicopter perspectives, an openness to information, an understanding of how human nature works and why people do in fact operate out of self-interest and how you can use all of that information to become a better, stronger advocate or a better mediator and resolve complex problems. Well, again, uh, so much you've said, uh, it just taps into a number of things that I know a lot of the work that I do with um, attorneys and mediators is, is to look at those different biases that we naturally exist and to help understand how they can play into a dispute. But also I have a piece on thinking about thinking and looking at cognitive distortions and there's 12 common ones. And so if we're aware of these kinds of things, then this is information we can use to check into our own awareness and level of, of development. I like to say we, we it's important to learn, live, and then grow uh, in whatever way. And with the whole thing about perception, too, is from a, a behavioral standpoint, if we never reach out to engage in a conversation, we'll never have that conversation. And to recognize, too, I like to say from an emotionally intelligent perspective, there's always so much I can possibly ever know about any any several tracks, for example. But there's always going to be something that somebody else knows that I simply don't know. So I'd yep. like to use that that paradigm, that model of at any given time, I may be unconsciously incompetent. I simply don't know what I don't know. And then yeah. something happens. And how can we learn from that, grow from that? Because too much of our world and our brain tends to operate this naturally, looking at things, you know, as, as fear or danger, black or white, right and wrong. And to me, that's such a dichotomy that serves as little purpose in terms of human uh, interpersonal connection and dispute resolution that it's about broadening our mind and what can I learn from you differently just like you know this has been such a rich conversation for me today to have with you because I'm so looking forward to finishing your book because I haven't gotten through it yet but just you know reading and listening to what you've had to say I, I just really really admire and appreciate deeply the time attention and energy you put to this, both on such a conversational way, but also from a very intellectual research-based way. I'm very much, what's the research say? Let's look at yeah. the evidence here. Yeah, well, what's great about the book is that in the back are all the research sources, right? Yeah, so, there's a thousand, right? Yeah, there's, there's more than a thousand okay. uh, research sources that I went through over a period of five years, right? So I did the heavy lifting mm -hmm. and I went through all of that and I read all of that and then I distilled all of that into bite-sized chapters that are only one to three pages each. And so oh. it, it covers 182 chapters of things that I think you need to know to survive and thrive in the 21st century, things that I found fascinating, things that I found profound, things that I thought, wow, I'm glad I know that. There's so many different ways to mm -hmm. elevate yourself and to profit from that information. And, you know, I can give you a simple example. If we were going back 100 plus years and uh, Coca-Cola were not yet a thing, and I had a bottle of Coca-Cola and I was drinking and I was introducing it to you. And I said, doctor, you got to try this soft drink. It's just phenomenal. It's wonderful. I think it's going to be a big deal. And you tried it and you loved it. Right. And then you started paying attention to it. You saw that it was catch catching on. And so you bought a little bit of stock. You bought $500 worth of Coca-Cola stock way, way back then. Well, today that would be worth tens of millions of dollars. Right. So just having that knowledge would have been phenomenal for you. Mm -hmm. right? So I can tell you in one of the books, yeah, one of the chapters in the book, and there are many that are like this. We talk about glass information storage, which most people don't know about. We talk about longevity escape velocity, which most people know, don't know about. We talk about asteroid mining, which very few people know mm -hmm. about. Right. But Larry Page and Eric Schmidt, for example, have invested in a company called Planetary Resources that will engage in asteroid mining. 
right? <laughs> so why are they engaging in asteroid mining? Well, they have identified an asteroid belt that is mineable uh, with a potential of about 5,000 asteroids. Just one of those acid asteroids, an asteroid called Davida, has more than 10 times the global GDP in precious metals. So, oh, wow. so the global GDP, the US GDP is 20 trillion, the global GDP is 100 trillion. And here's a single asteroid, one out of 5,000, that has over a thousand trillion dollars worth of precious minerals, right? Mm -hmm. So first of all, that alone would tell you to keep an eye on planetary resources and other asteroid mining companies, mm -hmm. because these are going to be big business. This is going to be a whole new industry, right? But there's more. What you learn in the book is that the precious minerals, which are 10 times the global GDP, are not the most valuable thing on the asteroid. The most valuable thing on the asteroid is water, H2, H2O, because all of NASA's 135 space flights have been fueled by rocket fuel made from hydrogen and oxygen. So if you have hydrogen and oxygen available on the asteroid, the asteroid becomes a gas station where you can refuel, you can create rocket fuel. Now, when you further know that in order to take one ton of rocket fuel into space, you have to burn 10 tons of rocket fuel, you realize that outer space colonization is not possible without gas stations in space. So these asteroids open up planetary exploration and colonization. We don't get to Mars. We don't colonize Mars without mm -hmm. using this water on the moon or on the asteroids to refuel. So this is a whole new area that nobody's talking about, that very few people know about, but its significance is obvious, right? It's, it's, it's plain to see that mm -hmm. this is going to be a massive growth area, right? Yeah. So now you know. So mm -hmm. it first comes out, you'll be able to take advantage of that. So that's the type of thing that you'll get from Millennial Samurai. You'll get those you know, little gold nuggets, pieces of information, and it hopefully it will help you to survive and thrive in, in what promises to be the most extraordinary period in human history. Fascinating, because it, it was very easy to look back, even in the last hundred years, you know, here in this country to see the changes, you know, when my grandmother was back in the early 1900s and what she lived through and, and other major figures these days, but even in the last 50 years, even in the last 25 years. And so, you know, one thing I want to emphasize to our viewers is that while called the Millennial Samurai, this is a book not just for the millennial mindset, no. but to also open up the mindset for those of us it's who are going to be around a lot longer. It's for everyone. It's for yeah. everyone. Yeah, my, my, my reason in, in calling it that was because they're going to be at the tip of the spear. Yeah. You know, some of us are getting older. And so we're going to be less capable of changing the world. The people that are going to be at the correct age to change the world will be the millennials at, mm -hmm. at the point in time when the world needs them most. So we need to empower them. We need to download people like you and I need to download our knowledge. So what we've lost in, in age, right? In terms of our ability to maybe move as quickly, remember as much, you know, uh, be as nimble as we were 20 or 30 years ago, we have gained in perspective. We have a perspective that they don't have because we've been here longer. We've yeah. seen more. And so that is that wisdom, that perspective is, is the gift that we have to share. And we need to share it with the younger generations so that they can do the work that's required to save us all, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the way I see it. I, I totally agree with you. And uh, since I do a lot of workplace interventions where the whole generational differences and conflicts erupt, is that not only do we need to share our knowledge, being in the older working generations, but we also need to listen yes. to the ideas and visions that other younger people see, because they can take what we know and put out there in a wholly, totally different way than what we are living with right now. Yeah, that's a huge point. Because, you know, so, so our generation necessarily has a different mindset, because we lived through a different environment, right? Mm -hmm. So baby boomers, for example, if you talk to a, a millennial, a millennial today would rather make $40,000 a year at a job they find interesting right. than $100,000 a year at a job they find boring. Yes. Okay. Now, yes. my generation, our generation probably wouldn't have made that trade. Yeah. We probably would have said, no, I'll, I'll be bored, 
I <laughs> so as they get the money. <laughs> yeah, so I can get my house quicker and I can mm -hmm. get my car quick more quickly, you know. Mm -hmm. So, but they have a different perspective. Now, mm -hmm. we look at that, many of us look at that in from our generation, and we can't understand it, right? Mm -hmm. We 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 look at it as like they're making a mistake, right? But in truth, for the for the world that they are going to live in, for the world that they are going to live in, they need to think differently than we do. The way we thought is not is not going to work, right? Mm -hmm. So there, there needs to be more collaboration. There needs to be less of a emphasis on consumerism, mm -hmm. right? There needs to be more empathy, right? We're leaving capitalism has left too many people behind, right? Mm -hmm. It's been wonderful for me. Yeah. It may, you know, may be wonderful for you and for many others that are watching, but it hasn't been wonderful for everyone, yes. right? And so we have these large populations that have become tinderboxes throughout the United States and around the world tinderboxes of social disenfranchisement mm -hmm. and discontent. And these tinderboxes need to be addressed. They need to be dealt with. And the mindset that is not all about money, that is about cooperation, that is about quality of life, that is about empathy, is in fact, you know, a better mindset for mm -hmm. the future. So they don't really have it wrong. Much of what they think may be spot on. Mm -hmm. so we do need to listen. We do right. need to listen. Well, you know, the good old adage, one size does not fit all, yeah. and, uh, particularly as we grow. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, you know, we need to be flexible. We need to, I love the word adaptable in terms of, you know, we are living in different times and, and what's going to be ahead is going to be very different. And so help us all if we were to, to embrace the same mindset for moving forward as we've done for the past. That doesn't help us grow. So, well, George, this has been absolutely fascinating, and I can't wait to finish reading your book. Um, you know, I just want to share a couple things from some of your testimonials. One person writes about how they're at a crossroads in their career and life. They happened on this book and couldn't have come at a better time to break that bubble and to look beyond what's going on. Another one you know, emphasizes how this book is ideal for anyone, not just millennials. And I thought, if anything, I think the, the baby boomers would really you know, benefit greatly from reading something like this, that so many of us will age into many, you know, much further along than what our, our predecessors have. So George, you know, we've shared about the book, it'll be in the show notes, again, Millennial Samurai Mindset. How else might they get in touch with you or, or learn more about you? So they can go to georgejchanos.com. And they can learn all about me and they can reach out and they can contact me. They can email me at jchanos at gmail.com. And I'm on social media. I'm on Facebook. I'm constantly posting articles about things that are going on in the world, whether it's, you know, the war in Ukraine or what's happening in the Taiwan Straits. So, you know, if they're looking for some guidance and direction, somebody who's got the time and the interest and uh, the background to analyze these, uh, these issues objectively, and to provide a non-politicized perspective on what's happening in the world, they can follow me on social media or just reach out to me. But I definitely encourage them to read this book and it will open your eyes to what's happening. You're going to hear a lot more about these issues in mm -hmm. the next several years. I'm, yes. I've been, I published this book in 2019. So I've been out ahead of the curve on a lot of this, but uh, it is going to come to dominate the media in 2023, 2024, if not 2023, then definitely by 2024, okay. you're going to be hearing mainstream media will have caught up. And this is all anyone will be talking about. So it's good to get a jump on things. It's good to be ahead of the pack. It's good to have knowledge that others don't have. And that is available to you for free, you know, with if you download yeah. this book at millennialsamurai.com, or if you want a hard copy, go to Amazon. And, Great. and and buy the book for $29. Last thing I want to say is that, mm -hmm. you know, I wrote this for my daughter and for my nephews and nieces. And there is nothing that I will leave my daughter out of whatever wealth I transfer to her, nothing that I will leave her that I believe is more important than this book. And so you as a parent have a chance to get this for your child. And I, I cannot you know, tell you how more strongly why I believe you should. But I spoke to a group of 300 senior bankers in Idaho recently. And within an hour after my speech, all of the books were sold. Everybody who was coming up was saying, I need to get this for my children. Yeah. And you really do. If you've got children, yeah. grandchildren, it's, it's $29 on Amazon. Get them a copy of the book and have them read it. And the chapters are only one to three pages each. So you can, it's super easy for them to read. Sounds like it. And you can have discussions at the family 
yeah. on, on the chapters. Everybody can yeah. read a one to three page chapter about character or about courage or about commitment and talk about it at the dinner table. So it's a great kind of tool to facilitate those types of discussions. Sounds wonderful. And we could really use some fresh stuff to think about right now. And so looking ahead, and I know I'm definitely downloading this for my 25-year-old and 28-year-old and can't wait to have them read it and have some great discussions about this. And so shifting our direction in brand new ways. Well, George, thank you again. It's been an absolute delight to have you on Decoding the Conflict Mindset. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure meeting you and having the opportunity to speak to your audience. Well, thank you. And just as a footnote for our viewers is that George and I actually met on LinkedIn. You know, somehow our, our mindset, you know, taglines came out and jumped at each um, at each other. And it's like, yes, absolutely. You're a great fit for my show. And knowing about his background just brings so much rich, richness and awareness on so many levels. So George, it's been wonderful. I know our paths will continue to cross. And thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and congratulations on the work that you're doing, creating awareness and helping change some lives as well. Well, my goal is to change millions and millions of lives throughout the world. So programs like this do just that. Thank you again. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Again, Dr. Deborah Dupree, The Mindset Doc. Don't go away. Subscribe, join Decoding the Conflict Mindset so you will be kept abreast of our next exciting guest speakers coming up, just like George, bringing this fascinating, stimulating, and creative thinking to our daily lives and conversations for ahead. 